Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Voices of Calm, the holiday edition. I'm Andrea Ems, coming to you from California, and we're really excited to continue the journey of Scrooge in A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Now, before we get into the story, let me introduce everyone to you. We have three different narrators, Mike Cooper in North Carolina, Sarah Morsi in Florida, and Christine Rendell in New York. Also in New York, we have playing Scrooge, Doug Ramsdell. Playing Man 1, Man 3, and Man 5 is Adam Barr in Pennsylvania. I'll be playing Man 2, Man 4, and Man 6. And playing Charwoman is Danielle Cohen in Vermont. And playing Old Joe is J. Rodney Turner in Tennessee. And last but not least, we have Mrs. Dilber, played by Sarah Brands in Virginia. And we'd like to say a quick thank you to Dennis Daly and Kimberly Weatherell for putting the scripts together and making this possible for us. So thank you. And without further ado, Adam, take it away. Andrea, thank you and season's greetings, everyone. At this point of the story, if you've been following it for generations as I think we all have, you know that ghost by ghost and memory by memory, things are getting more and more serious for Scrooge. And the future for anyone is a scary place, but especially for Scrooge who isn't quite sure who is being talked about. So let's continue on with stave four, part one, the last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which this spirit moved, it's after gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The spirit answered not, but pointed onwards with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment, as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, while he, though he stretched his own to the utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. But there they were, in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants, who hurried up and down, and chinked the money in their pockets, and conversed in groups, and looked at their watches, and trifled thoughtfully with their great gold seals, and so forth, as Scrooge had seen them often. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, 
Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. A third man took a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff box before joining the conversation. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. Then spoke a red-faced gentleman with a pendulous excrescence on the end of his nose that shook like the gills of a turkey cock. What is he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. This pleasantry was received with a general laugh. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, for upon my life I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, but I must be fed if I make one. Another laugh. Well, I am the most disinterested among you. For all, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. But I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. Speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on into a street. Its finger pointed to two persons meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. He knew these men also, perfectly. They were men of business, very wealthy, and of great importance. He had always made a point of standing well in their esteem. In a business point of view, that is. Strictly in a business point of view. How are you? How are you? Well, old Scratch has got his own at last, eh? So I am told. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas time. You're not a skater, I suppose. No, no. Something else to think of. Good morning. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversations apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself, to whom he could apply them. But nothing doubting that to whomsoever they applied, they had some latent moral for his own improvement. He resolved to treasure up every word he heard, and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed and would render the solution of these riddles easy. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner. And though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Quiet and dark, beside him stood the phantom with its outstretched hand. When he roused himself from his thoughtful quest, he fancied from the turn of the hand and its situation in reference to himself that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made him shudder and feel very cold. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognised its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. Alleys and archways, like so many cesspools, disgorged their offences of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, 
with filth and misery. Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low-browed beetling shop below a penthouse roof, where iron, old rags, bottles, bones and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights and refuse iron of all kinds. Secrets that few would like to scrutinise were bred and hidden in the mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupted fat and sepulchres of bones. Sitting in among the wares he dealt in by a charcoal stove made of old bricks was a grey-haired rascal, nearly seventy years of age, who had screened himself from the cold air without by a frowsy curtaining of miscellaneous tatters hung upon a line, and smoked his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone to be the first, let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. Joe removed his pipe from his mouth. You couldn't have met in a better place. Come into the parlour. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two aren't strangers. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Ah, how it squeaks. There ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place as its own hinges, I believe. And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. <laughs> we are all suitable to our calling. We're well matched. Come into the parlour. Come into the parlour. The parlour was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it in his mouth again. While he did this, the woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees and looking with a bold defiance at the other two. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs Dilber? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true indeed. No man more so. Why then? Don't stand staring as if you was afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. We should hope not. Very well, then. That's enough. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone by himself. It's the truest word that was ever spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this, and the man in faded black, mounting the breach first, produced his blunder. Plunder, sorry. It was not extensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value were all. They were severally examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums up he was disposed to give for each upon the wall 
and added them up into a total when he found there was nothing more to come. That's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Mrs. Dilba was next. Sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. That's your account. If you ask me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now undo my bundle, Joe. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? Bed curtains? The woman laughed and leaned forward on her crossed arms. Ah, oh, bed curtains! You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with them lying there? Yes, I do. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching out, for the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Whose else's, do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. Joe stopped in his work and looked up. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? Don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, uh, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it? Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. <laughs> Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If Calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. As they sat grouped about their spoil, in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a detestation and disgust, which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons, marketing the corpse itself. Old Joe produced a flannel bag with money in it, and told out their several gains upon the ground. <laughs> this is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive, to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Scrooge shuddered from head to foot. Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? This unhappy man. I think it's natural for each of us to want, when our time comes, something with a little more ceremony than having our value totted up in chalk on the wall of a beetling shop. Then why wasn't Scrooge more natural in his life? I think we're going to find out as our story continues. Thank you for joining us. Please come back for more. But for now, for Andrea Ems and the rest of our cast, I'm Adam Barr. We thank you. <laughs>